Good morning and welcome to the NAACP. Uh, sorry about that. Good morning and welcome to the NAACP's premier event today uh, in honor of Black History Month. Uh, my name is Wally Aligbede and president of the Rochester branch of the NAACP. Last uh, week, we started our a series of events uh, in honor of Black History Month. We had a really good COVID-19 panel to essentially try to bring trust into the community uh, with healthcare. Uh, today, we have an honored guest, uh, Mr. Keith Ellison, the Attorney General for Minnesota. And essentially, we're going to be asking him some, some really good, insightful questions you know, about the justice systems and where do we go from here from, uh, from, from last year with the events of George Floyd, COVID, and a whole bunch of stuff. Now, in terms of the NAACP, you know, we've had a lot of, uh, uh, we have a lot of history. Uh, we established 1909, and from the Voting Rights Act to the anti-lynching bill, We've been involved in a lot of really big uh, pieces of legislation. And as we move forward, you know, we're looking for uh, Mr. Keith Ellison's uh, guidance and, and, and really also just uh, uh, insight into how we go from here. So, so really excited for you guys to, to be here and uh, uh, welcome. Now, uh, in terms of uh, today's uh, events, uh, I'm gonna be co-moderating with Barbara Jordan. Uh, who is our secretary. So Barbara, uh, I'm not sure if you are here. Awesome. Good morning. And, and uh, you all know Barbara from the community. I mean, she's our matriarch, a uh, wonderful woman, a wonderful leader, a uh, mentor. And, and essentially, you know, uh, Barbara has been, uh, and uh, her husband, Mr. W.C. Jordan, have been actively involved in the NAACP. W.C. Jordan, he is the president of the Minnesota Area State Conference. So, so Barbara, uh, excited to do this with you. Thank you, Wale, and thank you for your leadership. Okay, uh, uh, and so we'll just sort of get started, and uh, we are excited to have the Attorney General, Keith Ellison. Uh, Keith, I really appreciate you being here. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Wale and Barbara. Really a great, great morning to talk about um, the struggle and what we're going to do. No, we really appreciate it. Now, in terms of the, the series of events, we have some pre-formulated uh, 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 questions. Barbara and I were going to alternate. And then at the end of the, the event, like for about 30 minutes, there's going to be an audience Q&A. And so we'll have Great. the audience, they'll be able to uh, send questions and then we'll post it. And then that way you can respond to, to the audience and not just us. That sounds great. Okay, Barbara. All right. Well, let's kick it off. And again, Attorney General, thank you so very much for taking time out of your schedule, which we know is very busy to be with us. So our That's first question, question, thank you. Our first question is, personally, what does Black History Month mean to you? And are there some contributions from the uh, justice system that people may not be aware of that you would like to call to our attention? Well, <clears throat> Black History Month is a time for intensive study and reflection. It's a time where I don't just sort of like read an article here or there or watch a documentary or read a book about Black history or work on a Black history matter. It's a time when I go out of my way to make sure that that is what I am putting into my reading diet, that I'm, that I'm really learning more. In the course of the other nine months of the year, if I see an article that catches my interest, I'll read it, a book. Yeah, I'll read that there too. But Black History Month, I pretty much say, I'm not reading about uh, you know, just the economy in general. I'm not reading about law in general. I make sure that I take time to think about Black history, not only in America, but across the world, uh, African history, the, 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 the history of colonialism, and then also the Jim Crow segregation slavery you know there's so much we don't even know about it we, we you know we're legacies of it but we don't even know about it you know we don't know much i was at you know last year this time i was at cape coast castle in ghana west africa and uh those of you who know your black history you know that uh most of the people who are african americans in north america came through that place not too far from there is mina elmina and the people and the africans who were dragged there, they had, a lot of them went to the Caribbean or to South America. But the fact is, is that, um, you know, that's something that Black History Month made me want to go explore more. And you might, when COVID's over, you might want to get your travel budget on 
and go to Cape Coast Castle, <laughs> go to Elmina. Yeah. You Amen. know, no. these are all very important. No, I Amen. really appreciate you saying that. I mean, uh, originally from Nigeria, there is a lot of, yep. uh, you know, um, that area used to be called the slave region, the slave coast, you yep. know, and uh, names that I won't mention here, but, you know, uh, uh, not, and it's not the Negro coast. Uh, so th there's some history there. And when you look at some of the chains that the locks and people's mouths, not to be able right. to speak, it really, it, it lets you know how bad it was. So, well, if I may say so, Wale, you know, I went to, to this dungeon and above the dungeon where they had the Africans locked in there, above it was a church, <laughs> you know, right above it in there. They, they, the, in modern times, you know, I got to commend the Ghanaians because they, do such a wonderful job with curation. They really do see this as a world heritage site. And one of the things they did is they scraped up some of the residue that's on the floor of the dungeon. And what it was is a mixture of, I mean, I don't wanna gross anybody out, but it was a mixture of feces, it was a mixture of sweat, it was a mixture of human tissue, blood. And, the, and, and that's just evidence that the people who were stuck in there were, were, didn't have anywhere to go to the bathroom. You went where you stood. And these are people who were from extremely proud circumstances. Some of them may have been uh, already in bondage in West Africa. Many of them were cap just captives. One of the great um, stories is Abdul Rahman. I don't know if y'all ever heard of Abdul Rahman, but Abdul Rahman was the son of a king. And his father told him those people over there are fighting us and they were other Africans. I want you to go over there and lead the war party against them. So being a, an adult son of the chief, he does. On the way back, he has a small party, they capture him and he gets put on a slave boat, ends up in Mississippi, escapes a bunch of times. And then President Van Buren is the one who said, oh, this guy is the son of a king. We should send him back. They thought he was Moroccan, but he wasn't. He was a uh, from what would be Nigeria today. But the point is that he was do he was in Mississippi and this white religious um, missionary said, hey, I know you from West Africa. He said, yeah. He said, what are you doing here? You're the son of a king. You're the son of a, a leader. And he's like, hey, I was I got I got caught. They captured me. And I got and I got dragged here. And and so that's when they, they you know, the, 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 uh, the black community and the abolitionist society got him elite released. He could read and write in Arabic language. He could recite Quran from the beginning to the end. Um, and today, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're of Igbo background and a lot of other ethnic, ethnicities in Africa, the people in North America and South America are, that's your people. That is your people. And that's why you see Nigerians and you don't, until they start talking, you don't know where they're from because <laughs> they look just like uh, you know the the, the 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 children of the slaves, right? And so I would say to anybody, go to West Africa. It'll give you tremendous esteem for your African heritage. I was in Kumasi. I was in um, you know Accra. You know, and I loved it. I loved it, and I love the uh, just the spirit of the people, the kindness of the people, the creativity. And it was a wonderful trip. And I think one thing we should do in Minnesota is just raise money to bring around 20 kids every year to West Africa. I guarantee you it'll change their life and change mine. Wow. Thank you. I can see and I've been that all, gonna... And I've been all over Africa. I've been to Tanzania. I've been to Kenya. I've been to Egypt. I've been, to, I've been all, all out of Africa. But my favorite place has been Ghana, Ghana and Liberia, Nigeria. I love going to Nigeria. I've been to Lagos. You know, it's um, like New York. <laughs> oh yeah, it's packed. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's it's just like New York, and you know, but just, but like New York, there's also parts where people are really struggling, and there's also parts where people are really really rich, and they're both right. Yeah. I mean, you can go to parts of New York where it's like, wow, this is the most fancy place I've ever been, and you can go to places in New York and say, wow, human beings live like this, and the truth is, it's both, and it, just like Nairobi, you go to Nairobi, beautiful big buildings, glass, chrome, all that. Then you go to Cabrera and it's like, man, you ain't never seen no slum like this one. You know, so it's it's both, right? The African genius and the, and the African struggle all within about 20 miles 
in one metropolitan area. And so it's, but it's beautiful though, you know, it's, it's really, and the religious diversity and the ethnic diversity. I mean, as African-Americans, we all are like, okay, we're all African-Americans, we all speak English, we're all from Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, you know, and, and but there, you know, to them, you know, it's, it's like being from Kumasi and being from Accra is a very different experience, different language, different culture, different religion. And you get the sense of the diversity, the rich diversity of the African continent. And by the way, you know, if you know, somebody asked me, well, I, this was back when uh, Ebola was out. And they were like, why aren't you scared? You know, if you're going to Tanzania, aren't you scared? I said, you know, Dar es Salaam is as far from, you know, Cameroon as maybe New York. <laughs> you know, people don't have a sense, they don't know that the, the continent of Africa is big, really, really big, you know, and and so that that's another thing. So I'd say that uh, you've got to embrace your African roots. That's why I'm so proud of you two teaming up. Uh, you're you're telling the whole story, you know, you know, and it's very important. Yeah, I, well, mean, I, I, I can tell real quick, uh, Wale, and then I'm gonna toss it to you that yep. we're gonna have a a spirited and fruitful discussion this morning. So thank you I'll for that. Short, sorry, <laughs> that's okay. No, <laughs> uh, we learn from you. And I hope our audience feels the very same way. So Wale, I'm tossing to you. No, uh, uh, that, 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 that was lovely. And before I ask to say the, the second question, I, I mean, I think in terms of just uh, African-American black history, uh, there is a lot of richness. There's a lot of, you know, we're uh, from sons of kings and queens. And so there's a lot of history there. So, so appreciate you sharing a lot of that. So uh, 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 Keith, uh, Attorney General, uh, you are a pioneer in many respects, and, and you know that you were elected to Congress. You're the many of first, you know, the first uh, to, um, a Muslim uh, uh, to, to run. And, uh, and, and, you know, and I've seen you at several occasions. I've seen you doing eat. I've seen you talking to a lot of folks in the community because that's kind of like who you are. You're you know, the, the people's lawyer, so to speak. Right. You know, and, and so but, but we want to get to know the, the real Keith Ellison. Can you share your personal story, your leadership philosophy? And then also, you know, why does justice matter to you? Well, I'm still trying to get to know the real Keith Ellison, just so you know. You know, I mean, the, the, you know, the journey, you know, thinking so few of us take the time to reflect upon ourselves. Who am I? What do I value? What is important to me? What are my main motivations? You know, so I'm on a journey of getting to know the real Keith Ellison. But I'll say this, you know, I am the son of uh, two, two folks who uh, grew up in a segregated America. My mother's from Natchitoches, Louisiana. My father is originally from Burke County, Georgia. At a very, very early age, you know, the, 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 my father's side came to Detroit, you know, and we grew up there. On my mother's side, she grew up in, on a farm in, in Louisiana. Uh, there was a lot of African retention, I will tell you that, you know. Uh, and, um, you know, I grew up in a household where my mom was a was a civil rights person. My father, brave, strong, powerful man, still 92 years young, kicking it. But yeah, he was right. sort of, but his thing was like, make a good living, take care of your family. And his idea of, of, of a successful life was material acquisition. He cares about people and he cares about justice, but his main thing is, I wanna make money and take care of my family. My mother was like, we got to have justice. We're not putting up with this. You know what I mean? And she uh, was always active in things. Her, her father, a guy named Frank Martinez, was very active uh, in, in, in voting rights and civil rights in Natchitoches Parish, Louisiana. She inherited that. She passed it on to us. And so, um, you know, uh, my mother would tell us that, uh, you know, that Thurgood Marshall and Walter White stayed at our family home Little, little, little tiny house on Lee Street wow. in that in Natchitoches, uh, because my grandfather was a local president of the NAACP in Natchitoches and an activist, uh, and and so they didn't have hotels. And you know, black if you re, if you watch the movie The Green Book, you know that they did black people. There were there were some black hotels, not many, and in some towns there weren't any. And then so you stayed in the homes of African Americans, and uh, this was also depicted in the. Uh, in the Lovecraft um, country um, uh, film uh, series. 
And so, you know, that's kind of where my activism comes from. The people who raised me thought it was important to stand up and for your dignity, to stand up against white supremacy, racism, to never back down from mob threats. And of course, my grandfather, you know, he was organizing. They, they told him we're not selling him any gasoline because he's organizing black voters, stirring up a fuss. You know, all of us get along fine here. Why is Frank making all this trouble? And he and then they wouldn't sell him gasoline. He had to put tractor fuel in his car. And then, you know, they burned a cross in front of the house. Uh, and then they would call up the house and threaten and tell my grandmother that they had him tied up to a tree. They were lying, but they were trying to scare her and get her to say, Frank, you got to stop this. This is dangerous, honey. You can't do it. And he would like, honey, they ain't going to do nothing to me. And nobody lives forever, so I'm going to get out here and fight for justice. My grandfather uh, died at the young age of 42 in a tractor accident, but he lived his whole life fighting for justice. And my mother carried that to us and, you know, uh, that we just carry on that tradition right now. Um, I, I was not one who wanted to be a lawyer from an early age. Uh, it's something I decided to do after I got to college. I, I actually was studying economics and I got an undergraduate degree in economics. I went to grad school in economics. But then I said, man, what is my life going to be? Just studying the economy? I want to do something a little bit more hands-on. So I went to law school. That's what brought me to University of Minnesota. Uh, and uh, I've never looked back. It's been great. My oldest son is a lawyer, and my youngest daughter is applying to law school right now. So that's the story. Yeah, you, you got it in the DNA. You know, uh, you, uh, you know your family history, just the social justice. And we are glad that you chose the path that, that you're on. So, so thank you. Thank you, my brother. Absolutely. So, uh, Attorney General, we're going to stay on the subject of social justice, and we all know that uh, 2020 was a tumultuous year for all of us, um, underscored by the pandemic, but also for us in the community of color, the deaths of Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others really yep. had an impact. We'd like for you to, to talk to us and to our audience across Minnesota. Tell us what that meant to you, not only as attorney general, but as a human being and as an African-American and particularly being right here in the state of Minnesota. Well, one of the first activist things I ever did was work on police community relations. I was a law student and five friends of mine were having an informal little birthday party at the Embassy Suites Hotel. And there was some, uh, down the hall, there was some raucous party goers who were white the, uh, the hotel called and said we had a raucous party. Instead of going to the where the raucous party actually was, they went to the black party and beat up everybody and, 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 and arrested them and charged them with disorderly conduct. So friends and I organized, you know, uh, you know the Embassy Suites Five, you know, and we, you know, we, 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 we worked on the case and we raised concerns about it. We had rallies, we had different things we were doing. And, um, so this more recent, these recent events, these things that just happened were nothing new to me. I've been working on this kind of stuff for a long time. But if I may can recommend to our people listening, there's a book called The Condemnation of Blackness. The Condemnation of Blackness. And it's by a guy named Khalil Gibran Muhammad, who's a professor. And he just tracks how there have been commissions and task forces and study groups on police community relate police and black people and police and police since 1919 you know and they they've been doing every every few years you know police you know uh people get real tired of it people go to the streets they do they 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 march they sometimes they break stuff and burn stuff uh, because they just feel so abused and mistreated and um i'm not justifying it i'm just telling you what's going on and, but there was a, and so they did it in 43 in Detroit. There was a Detroit riot in 1943. Then in 1960s, we all know about, you know, the 60s stuff. And then here we are again. And it's because our country never faces the problem. We never say, look, liberty and justice for all. We say liberty and justice for these, not for those. And so people, re they react. And people think that when I say that folks react to police repression over the years, that I'm somehow condoning 
looting and or or burning or rioting or anything. No such thing. What I'm saying is that, you know, if you make peaceful protest impossible, you make violent protest inevitable. And I didn't say that. You know who said that? John F. Kennedy said that. So, you know, that's the situation that we're in. I mean, I've learned that the Minneapolis police had massive numbers of uh, folks who went on PTSD leave and may not be coming back. I, I view this as a short-term problem, but a long-term good thing, because we need to hire people in the department who want to protect and serve, who want to serve and who want to. We have a chief that wants to serve, and we have a lot of officers who want to serve, but there's a lot of folks on the force who are not there to serve. They're, they're there to be served and to um, you know work out their anger, frustration, and bullying on somebody they view to be uh, politically powerless. So there you go. I love how you keep you're keeping it uh, uh, 100. So that's that's awesome. You know. I don't that, know any other way. <laughs> so uh, along that same lines. So last year, you know, the FBI reported that hate crimes actually rose to the highest uh, numbers in decades, and bias motivated killings were also at an all time high. And from racism to Islamophobia, anti Semitism. I mean, the list goes on and on. And a lot of folks in our our community, you know, definitely felt that. Uh, what is your office doing to, to, to protect and mitigate and also prevent these types of, of acts that, that are really hurting, you know, all, everybody? Well, let me tell you, you are right. They are hurting everybody. It is very important to, to say and to point out that the white supremacist does not care about white people. What do I mean by that? You would think that if you're a white supremacist, you're trying to figure out how to get white people health care, how to get white people better education, you, might, you probably would be worried about school shootings where there's a lot of white kids who end up doing school shootings. You might want to worry about the opioid crisis taking the lives of a lot of white people. You notice you never hear the Klan, the neo-Nazis saying anything to help out the white population. It's all about you should hate them. They're under us. They're inferior. Beat them, hurt them, harm them. That's what the white supremacist says. They are not for anybody's good. They are for the amassing of personal power so that they can control things. Think of Trump as a, as a white supremacist. Is he doing anything for anybody, including his followers? No, he's all about put me in president, make me do serve me. That's the white supremacist mindset. So if you are white, never be fooled into thinking that these people are for you. They are absolutely not for you. They don't care about you. All they want you to do is you, all they want to do is use you to hurt others, to exalt themselves. Having said that, Clearly, the white supremacist hurts people of color, and one of the, and you got to understand the role of violence. Violence is not just the mindless, out of control expression. Violence is a political tool designed to exert dominance. If you know that if you go vote, somebody you could get lynched, then you're not going to vote, which means you're not going to have political power, right? If you know that you can be hurt killed, strung up, lynched by doing things, by engaging in civic life and exercising your civil rights, then there's a tendency for people not to exercise their civil rights and to be controlled and ruled uh, by others. So you got to see violence as a political tool, not just a mindless, crazy, out of control thing. Um, so what my office is doing is that, you know, before George Floyd uh, ever lost his life or ever faced Derek Chauvin on the streets of 38th in Chicago, George Floyd, um, we, we were talking about police accountability and we were talking about hate crimes. And I want you to know, I've been working on hate crimes for years as well. I mean, hate crimes, you know, again, you should know the rise in hate crimes is the rise of certain people who believe that we should not have a multiracial democracy we should not have a multi-religious, multi-ethnic democracy. We should have white supremacy. The last thing these people want is liberty and justice for all. You know, you all say the Pledge of Allegiance, you say, and what do you say at the end of it? And liberty and justice for all. They don't want that. They want liberty and justice for um, people like themselves only. And that is what we're fighting about. If you notice the culmination of the, of the white supremacist violence, hate crimes, that was the January 6th. And what did y'all see them waving around? 
What were they waving around the Capitol? Yeah, the flag. <laughs> Not yeah, American the con- flag. <laughs> the Confederate flag. The, ra- the, the flag of the traitors who tried to destroy the United States so they could own other human beings. That's who did that. But they also had something else, which leads me to the conversation around anti-Semitism. And I think it's important for people of color, black, brown people, to, to understand something about anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is probably the oldest form of white supremacy. Before Europeans showed up at Almina or Cape Castle and said, uh, sell us some black people <laughs> to work farms in, in, in the Americas, there were these things called pogroms where the non-Jewish community would roll up into the Jewish community and kill everybody. And this is called a pogrom. And they would murder folks and they would come up with all kinds of myths. They would lock people in the ghetto. Actually, ghetto is not an English word. It comes from that old Yiddish language. And it means that the, and so here's the thing to understand about it. Anti-Semitism is, 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 here it is. You black people and you Latinos are too dumb to organize yourselves for your own freedom movement. Therefore, it must be the Jews. You understand? So like when they murdered those people at the Tree of Life uh, synagogue in, in Pittsburgh, what, why did they do it? Because they thought those people were helping let us, people from Central America escape the tyranny. So they said, oh, you're funding the ter- caravan. When you hear people talk about Bloomberg and Soros and P- Steyer, that is a throwback to something where they used to say the Rothschilds, basically the international Jewish conspiracy. That's what it's about. And you should know that that is what they mean and that is what they're talking about. And it's a way to both say that black people are inferior and stupid and unable to solve their own problems. And so it must be a white person paying for it and organizing it. These things are not true, but it is fits within the white supremacist mythos. So we should understand that. I would also commend a few other books. There's a book called The Turner Diary. Now it's a racist book, so I would not buy it, but I would borrow it from the library and it's and it kind of maps out white supremacist ideology. The Turner Diary. It's the book that Timothy McVeigh used to blow up the Murrow Building in 1995. Another book I would use, I would read this. This book is actually very dense and hard to read. Um, even for people who read every day and all the time, like I do, it's called uh, The Camp of the Saints. But if you take your time, you can get through it. It's written originally in French, and is the, the all of the versions that I've read in English are not very great translations. So you, I, I found myself rereading paragraphs just to understand <laughs> what they were talking about. But The Camp of the Saints, and this is all about how Europeans, how by the French had to commit a genocidal murder against brown skinned people in France to, you know, make their country great again. And so you need, you need to understand, and you know, you remember Charlottesville, how they were saying Jews will not replace us. Yeah. Y'all heard that? They yeah. weren't saying blacks will not replace us. They were not saying Latinos will not replace us. They were saying Jews will not replace us. It's important to understand that they, they think that, that of what their philosophy is and how they see the world. So, you know, I just mentioned that so people can understand how to connect those dots. They believe that there is some international Jewish conspiracy to flood white countries with brown people to weaken the white people's gene pool. And when these people say they want their country back, you got to understand what they mean. They mean they want you out, you know, uh, or at least they want you under them to do their work for them because they don't want to do it, you know, so. That's kind of the philosophy. That's kind of what. That's kind of what it's about. White supremacy is not just some, you know, tobacco chewing guy, you know, who said who's throwing the N word around. In fact, the white supremacist is almost always an intellectual. When I, trust me when I say yeah. so. The white supremacist is almost always an intellectual, a powerful business person. And if you look at the progenitors of these ideas, that is what you will find. A lot, lot, lot of hate out there, uh, but we we need uh, to really uh, bring more love and and, and action. True. Right. No, you're right about it. You, I will, if I'm if you don't mind me saying, Wale, the way to, how do you counteract it? Human solidarity. That's how you counteract it. You've got to connect with people. You've got to tell people 
look, just because I have more melanin than you do doesn't mean we're not in one human family, doesn't mean we can't work together to solve our common problems. Those white supremacists are only telling you who to hate. They're not doing anything for you. Let's get together with some people who are going to solve some problems around opioids, wages, trade. Let's solve our problems together. And, uh, and, and that is the way forward. Um, but the truth is, is that the white supremacist ideology, um, you know, tries to lure white people out of partnership with the multicultural coalition, uh, but never really offers them anything uh, to improve their lives. Wow. Um, thank you for that history lesson. And I was an English major uh, attorney general, so these titles and books just resonate with me. So thank you. Well, I perhaps we'll even post them on our, our uh, NAACP website so people yeah. can, can find them. So let's stay a little bit on the issue of law enforcement and public safety. Right. Of course, we all know of the multitude of, of instances where Black people have been, Black and brown people have been killed at the hands of police. And, right. you know, in general, we see very little happen in the way of punitive um, or, or, or punishment for these these crimes. And we view them as crimes and they've often been proved to be crimes. So Black Lives Matter, Attorney General, we know you believe that, but can you share your ideas so that our audience is aware that the criminal justice system is for them and that in our communities of color, um, justice will be served and can be served. Well, you know, even in the most ideal society, you're going to have a criminal justice system because individuals, you know, harm others, you know. Um, but what has happened in America is that the criminal justice system has been used as a system of social control and to preserve racial hierarchy. And so that's the problem. We do need to separate um, that this, this drive to use the criminal justice system to preserve racial hierarchy and the legitimate uses of the criminal justice system. Uh, and, you know, I think it's important for people to know that if you look at all the exonerees, they're overwhelmingly people of color. It's a lot easier to convict a person of color than, than a white person in America. Um, what I'm saying is, is not controversial. Um, it's actually true and statistically demonstrable. Um, and so, you know, the, the thing is, is that the criminal justice system is a system that we should have, and it's a system that we need. My advice is to encourage people to get involved with it. There was a recent study, I believe it was out of Chicago, which shows that officers of color are much more likely, much more, much more likely to avoid the use of deadly force. It's a, it's just, you can look it up. It's a study that came out, I think within the last week, it's very, very soon. So we need to diversify police departments because we know that officers of color are much less likely to uh, engage in racial profiling, racially motivated traffic stops, uh, and excessive use of deadly force. But, but of course, we, we have to go much further than that. We have to look at how juveniles are treated. I believe we should eliminate the death penalty because I don't believe you can do it right. And thank God in Minnesota we don't do it, but the federal, federal government could do it even in Minnesota. Um, and, you know, but if you look at the death penalty, it's almost always uh, applied in a racially disparate matter, manner. Um, we need to change some of the laws and understand that, you know, that these drug laws really, uh, really, really took a whole generation of, of black men and just separated from them, fa their families, um, you know, took a economic provider out of the household um, and, uh, you know, so, so now, and now that we're dealing with meth and, and opioids, you know, the society is taking a much more humane approach, which is right. I don't blame the society for taking a humane approach. It should have taken a humane approach with crack cocaine as well. You know, I mean, drug addiction, being a, an illness, you know, and, uh, we needed more treatment and we, that's what we needed. We didn't need front end loaders going through some, a public housing project. We needed compassion and treatment. And, um, you know, at the same time, I do believe in, in, in accountability because while African-Americans are overly represented as defendants in the criminal justice system, a lot of black victims will tell you that they don't, it doesn't feel to them like anyone cares that someone killed their loved one. 
that anyone, you know, their daughter got raped, who's, look, who's looking for that person, you know? I mean, you will hear black victims feel like they're cast to the side. So what we know is that African-Americans are overrepresented as defendants, underrepresented as victims, even though African-Americans are quite often victims of crime. And so people just stop. You know, I've heard, uh, I've heard people say, I don't call the police in a domestic violence situation because they might cause more trouble than, than, than offer help when they get here. Now, that's sad. You know, it should be that if you need the police, you call them. You shouldn't have to think twice. What are they going to do when they get here? So we've got a lot of reform to do, and that's why me and Commissioner Harrington pulled together a task force on reducing deadly force encounters with police. Now, somebody said, well, why do you call it deadly force encounters? Because not all deadly force encounters are shootings. George Floyd wasn't killed with a gun. Eric Garner wasn't killed with a gun. Breonna Taylor was killed with a gun. But, you know... But, it, but what we're talking about is unlawful uses of force resulting in death, right? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things we need. We, need we, we have some good folks who are leaders in the police, in policing. We need to do some things to create greater accountability among the rank and file. And our society does have to confront police federations that often are the force of reaction. You know, in Minneapolis, Bob Crow was the leading voice against police reform. You know, and we would say, look, what can we work together on some reforms? His attitude was absolutely not. Everything we do is just fine. It's them. But then everybody knows that, um, you know, look, if you look at the 2007 financial crash, where, where, where was it not a crime to defraud investors to get them to invest and what you knew was a fraudulent security. And then when they all did and the security went down uh, and then you, you, you had happened to buy um, insurance on, the, on that security. So when the security that you provide, uh, issued went down, you made money because you collected on the insurance, something called a credit default swap. So think about it that way, right? What crimes are considered crimes? <laughs> what wrongs are considered crimes and what wrongs are not? I mean, is it not wrong to lie, deceive, and defraud people and cause them financial ruin and shake a whole pension fund from being able, unable to provide for the pensioners? Is that not a crime if you do it based on deceit and misrepresentation? I think it is. Why don't we punish it? Why, do we, why does a 19-year-old with five grams of crack cocaine uh, pretty much for sure going to prison for a long time and somebody who defrauds literally thousands, maybe millions of people in a securities fraud doesn't get any time, right? Uh, so, I mean, why is that fair? So we, we, a lot of times we'll fall into the narrative, oh, well, blacks commit more crime because they're in, they're in poverty, they're desperate, so they do desperate things. That's not true, <laughs> you know? It's just what do you want to call a crime, right? It's just what do you want to... We know that whites and blacks smoke marijuana at the same rate according to the Center for Disease Control. How come only the black kids are arrested for it and get a criminal record for it, right? I mean, you know, we've got to really ask ourselves about these things, but there is a reform movement on, reform in the area of bail, reform in the area of juvenile justice, reform in the area of sentencing, reform in the area of how we conduct trials, compensated testimony of witnesses is now being looked at as not a good thing, you know, because we know people sit up in jail and read the newspaper and then call the police and say, oh, yeah, if you give me, give me a time cut for the wrong I did uh, if I say that this person uh, confessed their crime to me, which happens every day. Shouldn't we look at these people with some skepticism? You know? So there, there are a number of things happening. We are in a reform phase. Uh, the pendulum is swinging back, but we're not back. But it's on its way back if we continue to raise the issues. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, on the whole, uh, you know, when you're talking about the pendulum swinging back and, you know, I mean, our next question, it, it's it's really uh, a more deep dive into the, the whole issue of George Floyd and specifically when you look at just systemic barriers, you know, that impede justice. Because, I mean, there is a lot of fear in our community that we've seen this story before. We know what's right. going to happen. There's not going to be a conviction. There's going to be a slap in the wrist. 
and there's going to be let's look at all the evidence and obviously we're all for that but at the end of the day nothing ever happens and so how do we build trust you know in that kind of a system so my question uh to you is can you tell us where things are at now you know in terms of the process of the the murder of george floyd and what is your office doing to make sure that uh we can actually move towards justice well my office is the office um, prosecuting the, the uh, defendants in the George Floyd matter. Uh, it's our case. And because of that, I am restricted from talking it in depth about it. There are certain rules which prohibit lawyers from saying things that a juror, a potential juror might hear and then influence their decision making. So I'm going to um, admit up front that I can't say everything that I know. But what I will say is that we're working extremely hard. We, uh, if you have information around what happened to George Floyd, contact our office, let us know. Um, we believe that nobody is above the law, including members of law enforcement. Nobody's beneath the law, including George Floyd or anybody else. And we're seeking equal justice under the law. Now the trial date is set for March 8th. My office has been very concerned about COVID spread and the um, infection. And we're con and so we've asked the court to move it for just a few weeks to make sure that we get more people vaccinated. So far, the court has declined to do so. And we're doing, but we're, so, but at this point, until we know otherwise, the trial's on for March 8th. My staff is working day and night to be ready. We will be ready. And I believe uh, in the case very much. Uh, and uh, believe that everything we charged, we can prove. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, I don't want, I'm a minister of justice. I'm not a minister of punishment. I want the defendants to get a fair trial. Even though I'm prosecuting them, I still want them to get a fair trial. I don't want anybody to say after the trial's over, if we get a conviction, that, oh, well, it's because the state did something they shouldn't have done. Nope. We're going to play this perfectly straight, and we believe in our case. You know, I'm going to tell you this, you know, here's many people in the black community are familiar with words like faith, hope, right? And what I'm saying is, yes, there's been a lot of injustice in this area, but what are we going to do about it? Quit? No, we're going to keep on keeping on. That's what we're going to do. You know, we're going to, that's what we're going to do. We're going to keep seeking justice and with the full faith that we will God willing, achieve it one day. And so we might have failed 50 times before, but we're going to get up and try 51 times. And then 52. No matter how much it takes, we're not going to quit. Frank Martinez never quit. They, 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 they threatened it. They said, we ain't going to sell you no gas. We ain't, we're going to burn a cross on your house. We're going to scare your wife. And he said, well, you know what? Do what you got to do, because I'm going to do what I got to do. Full stop. Yeah, that, yeah. This is this is. Uh, it reminds me of like uh, the late uh, John Lewis. Uh, uh, essentially, you know, uh, you got to keep the faith and keep our eyes on the prize. That's it. That's it, my brother. You're absolutely right. And um, see, the thing is, you know, people act like racism is a new thing. <laughs> what are you talking about? I mean, like if there were people, you know, slavery existed as an institution from 1619 to 1865. And I say not, and some people say, well, no, Keith, 1863. No, no. In some places, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation. In some other Can places. Can we say Texas? Can we right, say Texas? Texas. <laughs> right. So, so what I want to say yeah. is absolutely, that's where Juneteenth comes from. And so Amen. What I, so what I want to say is that, you know, that's like 200 and almost, that's around 250 years, right? Yep. So. How many generations of African-Americans were born, lived their whole life and died in slavery, and yet they still ran, they still resisted, they still fought for every little scrap of dignity that they could get. And then for a hundred years after that, they lived in Jim Crow, but they never, but they never stopped fighting it. And then that ended, I'd say in the Voting Rights Act, 1965. And then we've had societal racism for 60 years. I'm saying, let, I'm saying, you know, there was a generation that saw the end of slavery. 
they thought it would never be over, but it, it got to be over. There was a generation that saw the end of Jim Crow. They thought it would never be over, but it, was, it got to be over. Let's be the generation to end racism. What if we were the generation to end American racism? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. It'd be all and right, on, wouldn't it? That would be amazing. And on that note, Wale, do you want to remind our audience real quick about questions? Because we're we're about uh, 10 minutes until we move to audience input. Yeah, our audience are actually, they are submitting questions on Slido. So uh, if you uh, if you want to reach out to uh, uh, Attorney General uh, Ellison, uh, go to slido.com, NAACP, Rochester, MN, put your questions there. And then whichever one has the most vote, we'll... Uh, uh, we'll uh, uh, We'll, add, we'll, we'll, add, we'll ask those questions, so. Okay, well, Attorney General, that was your intermission because you've been going full stop here for, <laughs> <laughs> for the past almost I'm an in, hour, but I'm into you're it. all in. All yeah, right, well, we're I'm gonna take it. a little bit of a pivot here and ask you a question. Um, I was very intrigued by all the, the opinions that have been uh, issued by your office. And one of them that, uh, you know, again, full pivot here, related to not prohibiting a student from graduating due to unpaid mill debt. Thank you for that, Attorney General. So with respect to education, do you have an opinion on the proposed amendment to the Minnesota Constitution as proposed by Kashkari and Page? Let me say that I do support it. I think it's the right thing to do, and I support it. And I, may I tell, take a moment to tell you why I support it? Certainly, please. Well, well, the Minnesota Constitution, uh, promulgated like 1857, has in it that, that, that there shall be a uniform system of education. A uniform system of education. It doesn't say much more than that. Um, you know, and that actually for that day was a pretty progressive step because there was a lot of people in 1857 that did not go to school at all. There was no public system of education in many places in this country. So it was a progressive step forward. The fact is, is that the courts have looked at this provision of the Minnesota State Constitution, and what they have come up with is that, you know what? It, it guarantees all kids an adequate education. Now, are we shooting for adequate? I'm not. I'm shooting for excellent. I think that our Constitution, if it said that students are guaranteed uh, as a civil right, um, a uh, quality, affordable public education that would reset how we do things. It would recalibrate. Now, it would be disruptive, and I'll admit that. But, it, but what it would say is that, you know what? We, in this knowledge-based society, we are going to make sure that everybody has some knowledge. In this society we live in today, if you don't know anything, you pretty much can't make a living. And so we need to make sure everybody has a skill, knowledge base, so that they can be competitive in this global environment. So I'm all for it. I mean, I do respect the people who have questions. Uh, teachers wanna know, okay, that's nice. You're gonna put these words in the constitution, but are you gonna put money behind it? My answer to them is, if the constitution requires it, yeah, the money is gonna follow. There's other people who say, well, we don't know what it means. It's gonna, it's good. It could be, it could be, end up not being good. I'm like, well, then we change it again. But the bottom line is, you got all these black kids not able to get the quality of public education they deserve. We got to do something different. You know, we got to do something different. And I think it might have some implications beyond the classroom. Maybe we begin to see how much housing stability is connected to educational opportunity. And we start doing something to make sure all kids have a quality place to live. What if maybe we start saying, well, you know, kids need a place to live. They also need to be able to go to the doctor. And they also need, and that means mental health. We start putting resources where they belong to ensure success for everyone. And I think that's what we should. And so I'm a supporter of it, but I am respectful of my folks who don't agree. I think that this gives us an opportunity to really talk about what does a quality education look like? What are we mm. shooting for? What's our vision, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know that, you know, there's this, um, there's a, there, you know, going back to Africa, there, there are a few, um, there's a few um, movies out where these kids, 
using really simple items of you know, innovated around solar energy and a bunch of other stuff. And mm -hmm. my point is, you know, let's unlock the brilliance in the minds of our children. Could cure to cancer be locked up in the mind of some seven-year-old little black girl? Well, if you don't cultivate her mind, she can never give that gift to the world. You know, could the answer to climate change be locked up in the mind of some, you know, little, you know, little five-year-old Somali immigrant? Maybe. But we'll never know if we say, well, that kid, we're not going to invest in that kid. You know what I mean? Could, could the answer to, uh, you know, human solidarity, bringing people together, be locked up in the mind of some 15-year-old uh, black kid who just wants to do debate or do a model United Nations experience, but his school doesn't have that? Or is the next generation of robots locked up in the mind of some, some African-American kid but we don't have no robotics program for your school, so you never know, right? I'm gonna tell you, when I was a kid, I mean, I don't know if y'all, so this is my cello. I've been learning to play this thing, right? See it, right? I've been learning to play this thing. <laughs> what, what if, what if it's the school I went to, there was a program where I could have learned it when I was three, four, five, six, seven years old? I could actually have a real job. I could be a cellist in a symphony orchestra instead of having to be some old Jack Lug lawyer. I mean, but but my point is, what uncultivated talents do we all have that because of lack of opportunity, we never realize, right? So this is why we gotta have a better educational system, not just for the needs of industry and the economy, but for the needs of the human spirit, Amen. you know, music, art, poetry, all that stuff. Look at that little black girl uh, doing that poem at the uh, at the um, yeah. inauguration. Amanda, yeah, uh, beautiful. That, yeah. Oh my God, she just—I just man, I almost cried when I saw her doing her thing. And like, I mean, she's starting a revolution around poetry. The whole country's <laughs> talking about poetry because this kid is so amazing, you know. Amazing. And no, and. Amazing. and, and so and so like but what if nobody what if she never had an english teacher what if she never what if she mm -hmm. was never introduced to you know like poetry is a thing you can do and people pay pay for it you know people will listen to you i mean but like what if she just never had that opportunity and so you know let's just unlock the genius you know that's all it's about i think great thanks you for sharing your opinion yeah thank that's you my for sharing take, that's your my opinion take on, on that it. Yeah. Wonderful. That's my take Thank on. you. Yeah. Unlocking the genius and making sure we have the resources to make sure there's mm -hmm. people. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. look, if you got gold up under, under the ground, only way to get it out is you got to have shovels and stuff to dig it out. Amen. It doesn't come up on its own. You've got to put forth effort to get those jewels. And so it's the same thing with the mind. And if you don't put any resources into cultivating that kid's genius, that, that it stays as a potential, but it never becomes realized. Yeah. Uh, powerful words. Um, we have about three minutes. I, I'm gonna just also quickly pivot. And uh, uh, basically uh, last year, I mean, uh, since January of 2020, a lot of the opinions from your office were related to the election process. And uh, so can you tell us, you know, uh, unequivocally that the 2020 election in Minnesota was a fair election? It was without a doubt a fair election. It was a fair election. And we had to go to court so many times to prove it was a fair election that I'm quite certain it was a fair election. Here's a good thing about Trump's behavior. He challenged it, uh, the election over 60 times if you look at over about 24 states, including Minnesota. And so he tested the system so much that he proved that it was sound. <laughs> that was not his intention. <laughs> That's not that was not what he was trying to do, but it, but I mean you know um, I you know look Georgia's Georgia has a Republican governor and Secretary of State they weren't trying to give Democrats nothing, but you know the sec and you saw Trump bullying the Secretary of State on you know in the tape y'all saw that you know what I mean yeah and so it's very clear that this guy is uh, is it was defeated fair and square. But see, here's the thing, um, Barbara and Wally, when they say stop the steal, it's very comparable to when they would say Obama was a Kenyan. They know Obama was born in Hawaii. 
no, they know. I mean, we're, we're not like, <laughs> we, they got us arguing over stuff that's obvious. They were saying that he wasn't legitimate. Right. That's what they were saying. And these people, what they're really saying is that, where, where did they attack the hardest? Milwaukee, Detroit, Philadelphia? <laughs> yeah. All right. Where did they, where did them places have in common? They yeah. were saying, what they're Chocolate saying is- Chocolate City. That, <laughs> they were saying that if Chocolate we only City. count, what they were really saying is if you only count the legitimate real Americans, wow. um, Trump wins. That's what they're wow. saying. But you yep. counted those people. So, and they're not legitimate. So huh. that's what they mean. That is what they mean. I mean, it's important to understand that there's so much that what is, what is being said is not necessarily what's be, what is meant. And what's being meant is not what's being said. It's called dog whistle. Yep. Now they can hardly come out and say, we think black people should not be able to vote. Therefore, because they did, Biden wins. Therefore, we think it's illegitimate. They can't really say that. But they can say, oh, stop the steal, right? Mm. And, and, so, and so what it really is saying is, it, is that Biden's not legitimate because he's mixed up with He's mixed up with those those people, and you know who those people are. You know, Biden won because of South Carolina. Amen. Biden yep. wasn't gonna win. Biden wasn't gonna be president. He was president because of South Carolina and Jim Clyburn, right? And so, you know, those people are like, look, you know, we we oppose multiracial democracy. We don't believe it should exist. We think those people should either be our servants or should be gone. And that's where they're coming from. And Trump, why do they love Trump? I mean, I'm gonna tell you, they are, and you know, these people who are voting for Trump, they know Trump is a, a misogynist, crass, ignorant, dishonest person. They know, they know, but because he signals white supremacy, they're like, fine, we, we'll put up with you. You see what I'm saying? Do, does everybody saw the uh, the uh, the um, the tape, the Hollywood thing where he's talking about grabbing a woman by her genitals? They all saw it. They know. And guess what? They don't believe that's right. They, most of them think it's wrong, but they say, but he's for white supremacy. That's why he could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and still not lose any supporters. He's just proved that he can order an attack on the Capitol to stop the vote count and not lose any Republican senator support. You know, I mean, think about that. And like, and like, here's the thing, in, in our country, this country, they wanna say that Latin America and Africa, that, that we, we don't have stable democracies. Well, it looks like this one could be a little bit more stable too, don't it? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, mean I, uh, it's, it, it's uh, as, a, as an African American uh, immigrant from Nigeria, I mean, this was something that I, uh, take really personal because you have a lot of immigrants all over the world that come to America to yeah uh, for the ideals right and uh when you talk about dictatorships when you talk about uh just even death you know I've had personal family members that have been killed because of just standing up for democracy and right you can't uh you know you just have to be able to look at the facts see what it is and, and stand up for 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 justice so you know, well, uh, you're right. my family was affecting my kids, you know, with Islamophobia, the, the Muslims right. and all of that. So uh, we need to focus on togetherness versus us versus them. Well, yeah. And and the thing is, we have to stand up forthrightly for multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious democracy. Yeah. And, you know, here's, here's the thing. There's a lot of countries in this world where everybody is sort of the same and they don't get along that great. I mean, like, you know, I got a lot of friends from Somalia, but everybody in Somalia is Sunni, Muslim, ethnically Somali, and they don't get along. There's no guarantee that just because you're the same that you're going to get along. And then there's countries like Nigeria, where there's over 270 different yeah, over 300. communities, over 300. And, you know, I'm not saying it's perfect, but it is the engine of Africa. It is. I mean, if you're looking for innovation, and creativity and a whole lot of you know if you're looking for a good story to be told in africa it's coming out of nigeria you know and so you know that that's the thing you know we can it doesn't matter that 
the United States as, as different ethnic groups, different religious groups, and all. We are pulled together by what we believe, which is the only thing we get, we can control, right? You can't control your skin color. You can't, and you say you can switch your religion. I did, but the point is, you know, if you're raised in a certain kind of family, you're probably going to practice that kind of religion, right? But you can choose whether you believe in a democratic country where one person, one vote, and we have minority rights. And yeah. that's what we have. And we just saw how fragile it is. And I hope that this event on January 6th creates a renaissance and a rededication of democratic principles in America. And, you know, it, I hope it does, because that's what we need. That's what this moment calls for. NAACP is dedicated to that proposition. Absolutely. So I Thank hope that you. that's true. I hope that's what happens. Thank you. Thank no. you for saying that. And Wale, I'm sure you're going to be teeing yeah. up these questions. I want to remind our audience and all of us that um, just as, as Attorney General just said, the NAACP is nonpartisan. And right. And it has served us well throughout our history, but we believe that right is right. And, and our mission is one of anti-discrimination. So your words resonate with us, Attorney General. And we, we again, are just so grateful for your participation. So Wale is gonna open up Slido now, and we're going to share with you some of the questions that have come in from our local and some, some of our audience tends to be all over the country. So Wale, what have yep. you got? Yeah, so uh, the first question is, and I'm not sure what these acronyms all stand for. I don't uh, know what it means. Okay, so I will will pass on that since you don't know what it means and I don't know what it means. Oh, uh, and, and if uh, whoever uh, posted this, if they can provide uh, a lot more context, we'll get it to you and then you can provide an answer and we'll get it back to the audience, if that works for you. That works for me. Okay. On the summer, uh, the campaign to defund the police gained popularity. Do you see that as part of the solution to put, uh, to police brutality? Well, I I have not used it used that terminology. I have not said defund the police, but I do understand what people who say it mean. They don't mean defund public safety. They mean let's take some of the police department budget and put it into more upstream um, areas to sort of reduce the need for the police in the first place. If we had more money in housing, would you have to arrest somebody for, for, for vagrancy and panhandling if they had a place to live? If you had more money in mental health, wouldn't that cut the number of 911 calls for people who are in a mental health crisis? If we uh, did, you know, put more crime, money in crime prevention, maybe some of the shootings would not even occur. So. That is what they mean. It's really sad that um, they didn't come up with a better way to phrase what they meant. And it's also really sad that the people who know what they mean kind of pimped it out to try to dis dis confuse people about what they really were talking about. So it ended up being kind of a poor way to phrase something, but I definitely understand what they mean. And I think there's a lot of value to reapportioning the police department budget to make it more designed to promote public safety and less into just more money with guys with guns running around you know that i don't i don't know if we you know i so like do we really do we really need a a, a person in a blue uniform and a firearm using force to investigate a fake 20 or do we need somebody who knows something about counterfeit money and you know because clearly you know, uh, there was never any evidence that George Floyd even knew that he had a fake 20. You, you know, and he, you know, so the bottom line is maybe, I mean, you were, any one of us could have got slipped a, a fake 20 and then pass it on now, you know, I mean, but it doesn't mean we knew it, you know, so do you really need a guy with a gun to deal with that, right? Yeah. Um, you know, there are uses for police officers who are going to come to the scene in force uh, and with force. There are certainly there are occasions where we need that. But do we need that all the time, every time? I think that we it's an opportunity to really reflect. Uh, the next question is, uh, OK, so the missing, murdered indigenous woman, uh, what are you doing to protect them? 
yeah, we this is a very serious problem. We are stepping up to uh, we right now we have a um, task force on women's economic security. We're digging into that. So many women who end up missing and, and murdered indigenous women uh, are women who are vulnerable before they ever get in this uh, horrible situation. So we're trying to strengthen strengthen that. We're working with law enforcement around Duluth and we're very concerned about some of these man camps that come up around pipelines and 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 because oftentimes that that is how you see trafficking take hold but it is a very serious issue uh, i'm in touch with state legislators about it uh and uh it is something we consider to be a top priority thank you uh the next question is colorado has ended uh qualified immunity for police officers do you see this as a step minnesota should take yeah i think it's uh, certainly worth looking into and i think it's so here's the thing, qualified immunity is a civil concept. What it basically means is that you've got to, that, that if police officers were operating in good faith, that they can escape civil responsibility for even the bad acts that they do. And I don't think that it's a concept that we really need. Um, in fact, I think it could lead to moral hazard. It's, you know, the moral, ha what is moral hazard? It's the idea that if you got an insurance on something, you might not be very careful with it because you know you can just make an insurance claim. Well. If you are an officer and you know that you, you don't have to be careful, then you don't, then you're not careful and you end up hurting people. You say, oh, well, I didn't mean to do it. It was not intentional. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, I think it's a concept that basically is just designed to stop officers from having to be responsible for their actions. The next question, and I think it's a, it's an important one too, is so where do we go from here? And you can sense a lot of frustration. Uh, we are tired and not willing to take this racial abuse anymore. So where do we go from here? You know, that's interesting. You know, so this person is asking me what they should do. I think you should follow the dictates of your conscience. I urge you to be peaceful and to be law abiding. But, um, you know, it's one of those questions where it's like, well, I don't, I don't know you. I don't know your circumstance. I don't know what you're capable of doing. I think, you know, but, but, but like we were talking about before, you know, the African Americans have been in this country since 1619 and every generation just keeps on trying to push the boundaries of justice forward. I urge this person to do the same, you know, and, and I think it's important not to ask the attorney general, what should I do? I don't know. Do what you think you should do. Write a poem file a lawsuit, um, paint a sign, go protest something. I, don't, I mean, but it's like, it, the, the hard part is not, what do we do? The hard part is, do you have the guts to do it, right? And not only the guts to do it, the patience and determination to do it. How many people do I know, what they call them 90 day wonders. They found out last week, they, they read Malcolm X a week ago, and now they're the blackest person the world has ever known. I'm like, come on, this is a long-term struggle. Nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Be part of the solution and ask yourself how you can promote justice for yourself. And don't go to any leader and say, tell me what to do. I don't know, about what? Give me, give me some specifics on the problem that you believe you're trying to solve. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is there are powerful elements in uh... The Minnesota legislature will oppose changes in criminal law. What's the solution? If you can't change the people's hearts, change the people. Run, run for legislature, run against them. We need to switch these folks out. Redistricting is coming out. Be part of the solution when it comes to redistricting so we can have fair districts. I believe that we have a chance to get, you know, districts where if, see, if you have a district that's totally Democrats or a district that's totally Republicans, then it's hard to get those people to change. But if you have fairer districts where the count is closer, you might end up with a Republican, but because the district is close, they got to listen to you, right? Or you might get a, you know, I mean, you, I, I would just say help be part of redistricting. I would say always vote and by all means run. And you can lose and still do a lot of good in an election by forcing whoever wins to take positions on key issues. So those are some thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, next question is, how do you see us taking steps to end racism in America? Again, you know, there are maybe 
35 million, 40 million African Americans, different solutions for different people. Maybe you should run for office. Maybe you should work on a campaign. Maybe you don't want to have nothing to do with electoral politics. You want to work on the nonprofit side of it, and you can do that. I think you should join the NAACP. Have you paid up your membership? Uh, are you part of the NAACP right now? You know, um, the NAACP has a lot of good ideas about how to end racism. But, the, but you know, do you want to end it in healthcare? If you're into healthcare, work on racial health disparities. If you're into housing, work on housing. If you're into financial literacy, do that. But by all means, do something. And don't ask some pie in the sky, like, how do we make everybody love everybody? That's not the question. The question is, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? Because yeah. there's a lot of ways to get involved. Please do. Mm -hmm. Even if, mm -hmm. if you get involved now, you may not, you may do this for six months and say, well, this is not really my thing. Fine. By doing something, you learn what you like and what you don't like. This is a vast struggle for human dignity. Get in where you fit in. You might want to work on black women's issues. You might want to work on black Muslim issues. You might want to work on black LGBTQ issues. I don't know, but get involved and make a difference. You can, it's a matter of energy there, but there is no, like nobody, you know, there's not, if you actually tried to write a plan for what all black people should do to end racism, you'd have a whole bunch of other black people saying, well, I don't really think that's what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so it's silly, it's a, but just, what did Frank Martinez, my grandfather do? He got involved. What did MLK do? He got involved. What did Barbara Jordan do? She is involved. What does Wale do? He's involved. I say get involved. The first step is for you to make a decision to be part of the solution. Don't look for no grand plan. Yeah, and, and also, if, yeah, from an NAACP perspective, I mean, we have plans in place for economic sustainability, education, quality education for all, Health, equi health equity, law enforcement. Environmental justice. Absolutely, you know, voting rights. Yeah. So uh, so we do have a plan, and as we always say, the NAACP is for everybody. It's a diverse group, and as long as you're for social justice for all Americans, you know, you're, you're family. So and if anybody I wants to ask me what they should do, yeah. my answer is join the NAACP. Thank you, thank you. We really didn't pay the attorney general to no. say that, but we are terribly grateful <laughs> to him for saying that. Unsolicited and testimonial. There you go. Yeah, and, and attorney general, I think what I've always said, and I agree with you wholeheartedly, you don't have to have this big transformative kind of effort. A little bit can go a long way. So in the aggregate, if Wale is doing his little bit and I'm doing my little bit and all of us in this community, do a little bit, then all of a sudden we've got a big transformative Absolutely. kind of effort. So I appreciate and underscore exactly what you said. Yeah. You know, Barbara, I like to say, which raindrop caused the flood? Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love your uh, metaphors and your allegory. <laughs> They're wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> so the next question is, let me pull the screen up here. What are you doing to stop line three and stand in solidarity with our indigenous community? Well, that's two questions. Um, look, I, I, I work on uh, tribal sovereignty all the time. We just got through uh, a, a, a case, an amicus brief that we wrote uh, in favor of the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe's uh, tribal boundaries. You know, we work on issues of tribal sovereignty every day and all the time. Now, when it comes to line three, the attorney general does not have a, a, a card to play in line three. Uh, we stand in the shoes of lawyers who represent the state of Minnesota. This is the governor's call. This is the call of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. This is the control call of the Department of Commerce. It's the, it's the call of the Public Utilities Commission. I mean, this line three comes up all the time, and I don't know, I don't know, I mean, you know what? I tell people, we, we don't have a card to, pl to play here. We can advise our clients. That is really all we can do. But I mean, but then I'm like, well, but, I, but we, had, we are suing ExxonMobil for their lies around climate change. We're doing everything we can do everything in our power we can to advise to advance the environment we do but i just don't have like line three card so i don't 
favorite line three. I wish it never happened. I hope it stops. Um, and if the and if the community opposing it wins, I'll nobody be happier than me. But I, but as AG, I have no magic wand to say stop line three. I just can't do it. It's not within my constitutional statutory authority. So there you go. Uh, and the the last question, oh, like not the last question. Can we as a people of color depend on you to do your very best? Yeah. Next question, what is something you're passionate about seeing change in Minnesota? What change do you want to see in the nation? I want to see our country move towards justice, true democracy, uh, economic fairness, prosperity for all. I'd like to see wages go up. I'd like to see big monopolies get smaller and have more market competition, which would open up space for women and minority business. I'd like to see um, uh, us have a sustainable green economy that lives in harmony with the, uh, the with the world. I'd like to see uh, women have full equality in our society. I mean, there's you know a lot of stuff. So, Attorney General, thank you for that. What keeps you awake at night? The Floyd trial. <laughs> have we done everything? Do we need to do anything else? Um, we are working extremely hard, but you ask me what keeps me up. That does. Um, what else keeps me up? Sometimes I stay up work, hoping and praying that nothing horrible happens to anybody else's uh, loved one at the hands of law enforcement. Um, I also worry about, um, you know, like other environmental issues, like, you know, we don't have a lot of time before we have to really seriously cut carbon and before the, the damage is irreversible and the world becomes unlivable for human beings. Um, there's a lot of things that I worry about. And as a matter of fact, what I worry about most is trying not to worry. That's why I go out and jog in, even if it's really cold, or that's why I play that cello or my guitar. I mean, mostly I'm trying to not worry. Uh, so there you yeah. go. thank you. Thank you for no, that. No, th thank you. Uh, um, I'll, I'll ask a personal question. And it's something that, you know, as a, as a father of a, of a Muslim boy, you know, um, I was really afraid of obviously the Islamophobia and right. yeah, what are, you know, uh, and we have, and it's not just uh, Islam, it's, you know, you have, you know, our sure. Jewish brothers uh, and sisters and people of faith, Amish, what have you, you know, yep. what is your message for, for, for the youth just to, to really pump them up with positivity, inspiration right. to, to keep going to, you know. Well, you know what, this message is, is, is based on facts and reality. Kids are smart. If you just tell them some puff up pretty stuff, they ain't gonna believe you. But so what I'll tell, tell them and what I do tell them is this, the more you know, and the more you study the situation, the more you will be able to feel control over your surroundings. You need to learn more about, if you're a Muslim, learn more about Islam. If you're Learn about Islam in America. Learn about the history of it in America. Learn, learn and, as a, and as a young black Muslim, you know, never forget that Islam has been in America ever since there was an America. Every, Islam goes way back in, in the United States. You know, there's, a, there's, there's places all over the southeastern United States, you know, where there's, where, you know, uh, as many as a third of the Africans who were dragged here were Muslim, right? There's a family history known as the, the Baileys. Well, what they really are is the Bilalis. And for Muslims, Bilal is this incredibly important companion of the prophet who was, who was the caller uh, to prayer. And so, you know, it got Americanized, Bilalis got Americanized to Baileys, you know? And these people, they wouldn't, have, they never ate pork. They pointed their 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 um, cemetery toward toward Mecca. They they prayed, you know. And even after the, the family lost the knowledge, um, they still kept the practices, you know. And that's right down there on the Sea Islands of Georgia in South Carolina. You can go there now. And so I would say, no more research, more Re you can you can research. More. Let me also say, you know, be proud of who you are. God made you this way, and the most high knows what 
it's doing, <laughs> you know? So don't second guess God, right? Just, you know, just, just say, you know, I am as I am and I'm glad to be as I am and be grateful for it. Develop your mind, develop your character. You do those things and everything's gonna be all right. And, um, you know, tell the truth, even if it costs you in the short term, because it's going to help you in the long term. Amen. And, um, you know, that's just be that person. Right. Um, so I would just say to, to, you know, when people harass you, say nasty things about you because your Muslim call you a terrorist or whatever, you know, resist the resist the impulse to get into back and forth with these kind of people. That conversation is going nowhere, you know. And, you know, and just read it. The best revenge is success. <laughs> you know, you, you want, you mad at somebody who mistreated you. You know what? Go be the A student in the classroom. Be the best, be the captain of the soccer team. That's the way. Because, you know, most of that stuff is jealousy and hatred any, in, anyway. Mm -hmm. So I'm real proud of your son. Tell him that we're proud of him. Tell him we have mm -hmm. great hopes and expectations for him. Tell him to try things. Tell him not to be afraid to fail. Even Michael Jordan missed more than half the shots he ever took. So don't be, so try things. It's important to experiment, figure out what you're good at, follow your passion. Never make just getting money your only goal. It's okay to get some money, but make make sure that what you're doing, you love to do. Okay. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much for that. Uh, war, words of wisdom for our youth. And actually next week we're, we're having our, our youth panel where we have, uh, youth leaders and you know they'll be sharing your dear you know basically uh your uh vision for the future uh, well can i quickly slip one in yes, here for you yes, yes please go i ahead. know i know folks are thinking about this i sure am because my two children grown kids live in minneapolis st paul area so the escalation of crime in our communities and i don't mean it's just in minneapolis st paul it's in our communities across minnesota and across the country. And it concerns us all, not just mothers and fathers, single people, young people. So Attorney General, can you tell us, is, uh, does the Office of the Attorney General have a role in helping to reduce crime in our communities? And can you, yeah. can you be a little bit explicit about that for us? Yeah, absolutely. We do have a role to, to reduce crime. Now, it is the police departments, the local police departments, and the local prosecutors who do most of that. But, you know, the attorney general represents the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, represents the Bureau of Corrections, represents the whole instrumentality of the state. And so we have a role in advising in that way. Uh, the clients are the ones who make the decisions, but we have the right to tell them the direction we think they should go. We also uh, are, uh, we have an expungement program, which is a program that allows people who have gotten in trouble to to get their record sealed so they don't have to go back into doing trouble because they can't get an opportunity in the, out here. Uh, you know, I'm on the pardon board. Um, and, um, and, and of course, we do criminal prosecution and hold people accountable for crimes they commit, but we do it mostly in greater Minnesota. But yeah, we have a very active role to play there. And, um, you know, but we can only prosecute somebody if the local county attorney or the governor asks us to do the case. So we don't do them all. So we usually come in and homicide cases that uh, are outside of the top eight uh, uh, ones. We also represent the Crime Victim Reparations Board. If you're the victim of a crime, we represent the board that is supposed to help you, you know? So uh, those are some things that we do. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Oh, we have uh, three more questions. Uh, so one is, uh, what would you say to the young black and brown kids who have seen what happened to George Floyd this summer and feel worried for your future? Uh, tell them that um, stay hopeful, stay positive. Uh, tell them that um, that they need to. They need you could join uh, the NAACP as a young person too and be part of um, criminal justice. Do something about it. Don't just worry about it. The best way to reduce your worry is to do something. And you can join the NAACP. Next question is, what are your goals for your career? I have very high goals for my career. I want to do justice and make Minnesota and America the most just, 
fair place possible. That's it. That's a, that's a great goal. Uh, and the next question is, what advice would you give to your younger self? Um, you know what? I probably would watch what I said more. <laughs> I would think twice before I <laughs> ran off at the mouth. Um, I probably would, um, you know, I, I, would, I think I'd been more reflective on things like that. But other than that, you know, I mean, I feel pretty good about Keith Ellison. So, you know, um, hey, the good, the ups and the downs, you know, we take it all in stride. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. 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 So uh, we are we are on time or, uh, uh, you know, it's it's time and obviously we respect your, you know, you being here and just uh, the words of wisdom. Uh, so for, for people, you know, uh, we really appreciate you guys joining. I mean, today has been a really informative uh, uh, event and you know from the NAACP perspective you know the reason why we bring speakers and, and leaders like uh, Keith Allison is really to really uh, uh, let us know what's going on in terms of George Floyd you know since he can say since he can say you know and also just uh, how do we move justice forward you know we've been the NAACP have been on the forefront for a lot of this and you know we're not just about you know history in the past it's also about making history and so right. everybody uh, has a role to play. So learn more about us, uh, get engaged. Uh, in terms of the events next week, we're going to have uh, uh, youth leaders. We're going to have Rochester Community Initiative. They'll come and join us. And then there's also going to be a young uh, uh, African-American uh, student uh, from Winona State and doing the death of George Floyd. Uh, her face basically went all over the world. Uh, it was an iconic uh, image. So we'll hear it uh, from the youth perspective. But Attorney General uh, Keith Ellison, my brother, Barbara, this has been uh, amazing. So, so thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Attorney General.